This is chapter four, and one thing about this chapter is that this handout is not in the book. So please, read the book. I am going beyond what is in the book. I have to listen carefully because this is a new material. And so we'll talk about terminology and the test workloads, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is actually, we're getting into the second part of our book. And this is the first chapter in the second part. Second part is about measurement techniques and tools. And so, um, so measurement techniques, basically we talk about what are different kinds of workloads, which workloads are commonly used by the analysis analysts and how do you select the workload type? How do you, if you measure the workload, then how do you summarize itself? Because the thing is, if you sometimes, oftentimes you don't know the workload, so you have to go and measure it, and then you have to, you have to summarize it. So everything that is related to measurement is, is covered in this part. This chapter is only about the first part, the workload. But there are other chapters that will follow in this part. And the quote is, to, is that basically measurements are not to provide numbers but insight. And that's the key, is that any analysis you do, this is not just for measurement, for anything else, people are not really interested in, in the details. They are interested in what is the new thing that you found out or learned, new information. So anyway, so the terminology for workloads is that you have a test workload, any workload that can be used in a performance test, performance studies. That is a test. Now the test workload can be real or synthetic. Real is that you put actual people on the system to use it. Synthetic is that you put computers to you know, test it out, right? So the real workload, observer system being used for normal operations. So you go to the you go to the system, let's say you want to do an ATM operation, so you just go to the ATM and figure out how often people use it, how what does it do, and all that, right? That would be real workload because you're not changing anything. On the other hand, you could have a synthetic workload where you have an ATM in your lab, ATM machine, and then you are doing something on it, right? So that would be synthetic workload. And so synthetic workload must be similar to the real workload. The advantage of synthetic workload is can, that can be applied repeatedly in a controlled manner. So you can do it 1,000 times, 5,000 times, but the real workload you cannot do it you know, on your demand. And, um, and it doesn't require very large data files. You could have one very small file and then you could just repeat. No sensitive data, so you don't need to look at you know, what exactly people are doing and you know, they may not like it either. Easily modified without affecting operation and easily ported to different systems and may have built-in measurement capabilities. Is that you, you could also put in the workload itself to measure response times and things like that. So believe it or not, most of the workloads are synthetic. So what are the desired characteristics of a synthetic benchmark? By the way, this information, if you want to find more, came from this paper, and much of this information in this chapter, this presentation came from this paper as well. And so I put the reference there. But basically, when you want to take a benchmark, and synthetic workloads are sometimes called benchmark, by the way, okay? Well, benchmark is actually test workload, but there is no real test workload. I mean, everything is synthetic. So, it must be representative. So, when you say, I am using a benchmark, and we will use the word benchmark for, from now on, then you have to say, what does it represent? Well, it represents the normal database operations. It represents scientific computing. If it doesn't represent anything, it's no good, right? So that is one thing, it has to be representative. It has to be portable. So I have to be able to run the benchmark on any system, and basically, because if, you know, if I have a Mac, I should be able to run on it, PC, I have to be able to run on it, and so on and so forth. Unbiased. It should not be designed to be basically biased towards one system. Scalable. Scalable means how big system can you run it on. So you can run it on small systems, you can run it on big systems. That is a good property. Measurable, it should be easy to measure, so that way a lot of people will use it. 
repeatable so that if I took a measurement and you took the measurements, they are somewhat similar. Explainable, they are single number easy to understand. So the thing is, world likes single numbers. So when you give a system, you say, well, you know how they measure the performance. They say, well, this is five MIP system. MIP is the million instructions per second. And people love it because that is the only number they have to compare, five MIP versus six MIP. And they know six MIP is better and how much better it is. But, you know, that is hiding a lot of details, right? But that is what the world wants anyway. So those are the seven things that good benchmarks would have. And uh, so history of benchmarking is that when we started computing, very beginning, the performance of the computer was measured by addition instructions. It can do five add instructions, well, not five, maybe 500 add instructions per second. Other computer could do 700 add instructions per second. Add instruction was the only instruction they had. Add and branch, add and branch, right? Add, test, and branch. The test and branch was not important. It was the add instruction which was most important. So that is the minimum instruction set. And then the instruction became complex and complex and complex, and more instructions were, were introduced. And so people started measuring instruction frequencies. They said, well, in the normal world, we have 10% adds, 15% multiply, 20% divide. So they set up a workload, a benchmark, where you do exactly that percentage. So you take your add instructions, multiply instructions, and performance, and then you use those weights to find out. Then they said, no, 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 that is not really good because it depends how the, in what order the instructions are called for and not just what instructions. So they said, we will put the real code in. And for the real code, they took a small pieces of code from different places and they call it kernels. Kernels is like, you know, when you have a agricultural field or a, um, what do you call this thing? So you, just a small part. So, for example, sorting is done very often in many places, sorting of data, things like that. So they took the sorting kernel and said, this is sorting benchmark, okay? And uh, so we also call them micro benchmarks because they were very small by today's standard. Then we went to bigger programs and we started calling them synthetic programs and then even up all, all this way, actually, they didn't really match the I.O. All they did was computing. So there was not much of network input or disk input or disk I.O. and other things. Then they started putting that in, and so that is application level benchmark. So now we are talking about web benchmark, where you will do some web access, get the response back, so it will go through the whole thing, network and disk and everything else. Our database benchmarks, where it will go through the database system on a cloud or not in a cloud. But all of these you can read in the book. This is all very well described. What, um, and some of, basically, this is also described, but I will talk a little bit more here, is that, so some of these benchmarks, famous benchmarks, are Whetstone. One of the, one of the very early benchmarks, 1972. Whetstone is a place of a name, or a name of a place in England. Whetstone. So the benchmark was named Whetstone. It was a floating point numerical code. And then LINPAC is a linear algebra package which was done in 1976 by a professor at, I think, UNC. And that became famous. It is so famous that it is still used even today. So if you go to top500.org, and I went there yesterday, top500.org, they list the top 500 supercomputers in the world. And how they are top 500? Because of the LINPAC benchmark. They just run that benchmark on every supercomputer, and whoever is the top is the top, and second, and third, and fourth is the performance order. And people try to get to the top, obviously, everybody's trying. So, so that is linear algebra packet. Simple linear algebra packet doesn't do any I.O., nothing like that, right? So, simple. And then dry stone. So, wet stone, this is actually a play on the wet stone. Dry stone is not a name of anything. <laughs> Because it is spelled W H E T, they spell it W D I H R Y, dry stone. And so this guy came up with integer workload, and um, as opposed to this floating point workload. And actually, these are all some of the names which were used. 
But the problems with these workloads are they are single person, somebody who thought that this is important, and people then started manipulating compiler optimizations and so on and so forth to get the best performance. And they are not subject to memory hierarchy issues. Also, they're so small they fit in the cache, so you don't have any caching issues, no I/O issues, nothing like that. So these are not really realistic. So the next step was vendor-specific benchmarks. Every company started its own benchmark. For example, Microsoft has now has actually Windows System Assessment Tool, which is built up in every window. If you have Windows 7 or Windows 8, you can go through uh, Control Panel performance information and tools, and you can run this on your computer. And in fact, when you install Windows, the window runs itself on the computer and then decides your computer is fast or is slow or whatever it is, and accordingly does its resource management. If it is very fast, then it uses some very innovative things. If it is not very fast, it doesn't use those things. So this is a benchmark, been set. And the re result is reported as experience index, Windows experience index. So it might say that your system has a WEI of 4.5, between 0 and 10. Okay? And um, actually, that number, the way it does it, measures five things. It measures processor, and it has a number for WEI. Your processor has a performance of 7. Memory, it measures your memory, and then, you know, has a performance for that, 2D graphics, 3D graphics, and disk. Five things it measures, and then the overall thing is minimum of five scores, and that's interesting. So if your um, disk is slow, and it has a score of 4.5, your whole system has a score of 4.5. All right? And um, so that is, uh, that is the Microsoft system. Similarly, SAP, S-A-P, Lotus, Oracle, BAN, all of these companies, which are very famous software products, they all have their own benchmarks. All right? And the advantage of these benchmarks is that they run binary code. So there is no compilation to be done. There is no compiler things you can play with and things like that. These are real code, which is machine code, runs on the real machine. Right? In the other cases, the other benchmarks that we'll talk about in a minute, um, this is the high-level specification, so then by the time you implement, people can do it differently. So then, basically, industry got together and they started benchmarks. So the topmost is System Performance Evaluation Cooperative, SPEC. So the most famous benchmarks are from SPEC. SPEC is an organization of companies Hundreds of companies go to the spec meetings, and I've been to them, you know, in my early life, many of them. So this has been all around for a long time. And you go there, and then you say, well, this is the benchmark, and we discuss different benchmarks, and then finally everybody agrees, they vote on it, and they say, all right, this is a benchmark that we will all measure our performance against. So spec benchmarks. Then the second one is Webco. It measures com personal computers, and... Um, Recently, there was some controversy about, and, and this, this comes up with the SysMark and benchmark, and there was some controversy about this benchmark that many companies left the standardization, this group. Anyway, um, then there is the EEMBC, which measures, um, which measures the embedded processors. What is embedded processors? The processors which are used in the cars, processors that are used in the printers, networking devices, cameras, phones, these are embedded processes, right? And people need to know the performance of those as well, so this particular group standardizes that. And in addition to performance, they also include energy, because that is one of the key things they want to know, how, much, how many watts of power does it take? So that is that. And then there's a TPC, which is for databases, Transaction Processing Council, SPC for storage systems. And if you go to Win, uh, Wikipedia, if you go to Wikipedia, you will find lots of benchmarks. Okay? There's no shortage of these. What I do want to give you is, in the next few slides, which I may probably not be able to finish today, is to do the spec benchmark suite. So, spec was formed in 1988. And... Um, 
what they do is they write they, they develop benchmarks which are portable portable means they are written in a platform neutral programming language so they might be written in java fortran or c which run on every system you can take the c code and compile it for your system you can take the fortran code compile it for your system in java right and so therefore they are subject to compiler optimizations so before you run this program you write your compiler and you up, you make sure that the compiler is such that it optimizes the code and this is done all the time so what they have done is um, they have written very detailed rules about what compiler optimization flags you should use and what you should not use and how should you measure it so there is a very detailed documentation about how to run these benchmarks and the current um, benchmark suite is actually they have many many benchmarks and many of these come and go so for example currently we they have a spec apc which measures the graphic rendering rendering so there is a spec apc which measures graphic rendering using autodesk another one using lightwave another one using maya another one using creo another one using siemens and solidworks so each of there are people who just use one of those engines right and they want to measure the performance with that so yes there is a benchmark for each of them spec view for which is again again graphics performance on the open gl systems spec cpu which measures the intel and floating point so integer and floating point architecture jbb these rest of them many of them coming up are java so this is server side java this is java enterprise edition servers this is java message service this is java run point run time environment then they have message processing on the parallel systems parallel programming energy efficiency of the server systems and then file server performance sip server performance does anybody know what is sip anybody knows what is sip yeah yeah wipe protocol voice over ip so sip server pro performance and then um, virtual virtualization is happening in data center nowadays we run lots of virtual machines so the virtualization performance so for everything that you may want to do there is a benchmark and then you compare many systems using the respective benchmark all right i don't think it is worthwhile for us to go into the class through any of these or all of these because these will change with time and you just have to know that these such things exist so the day you need it you go ahead and do google you know or wikipedia or something and find out more about these that is sufficient except you have to know about the existence of these things which is what we do in this class okay i'm going to stop right